In previous videos, we looked at some examples involving simple gear trains, and in this video we're going to look at something called a compound gear train. Now first of all, to explain what we mean by a compound gear, in this example in the top left hand corner, we have the gear B slash C. Now gears B and C are mounted on the same shaft, they're fixed together. And what that means is the angular speed of B is going to be exactly the same as the angular speed of C. So despite the fact that they have different number of teeth on each of those gears, their rotational speed is going to be the same. Now the same is true of D and E. They're mounted on the same shaft, they're fixed together, therefore the rotational speed of D is going to equal the rotational speed of E. I've added some arrows on there to show the direction of rotation. If gear A is rotating clockwise, then BC must be rotating anti-clockwise. And if BC is rotating anti-clockwise, then DE rotates clockwise. What that means is gear F, or our output, is rotating in the opposite direction to our input. If we were to add another gear or a compound gear, then F would rotate in the same direction as A. So it's entirely dependent on the number of gears between the input and the output. Now when we looked at simple gear trains, we had a number of different formulas for things such as gear ratios, input and output speeds and so on. And all of those equations still apply to compound gear trains with the exception of the calculation for gear ratio. So when we have compound gears, our gear ratio is calculated as follows. Gear ratio equals, and I'm going to write this as product of driven, over product of driver. So what do we mean by driven and driver? Let's start with driver gears first of all, because we can see that gear A drives gear B. Therefore A is a driver. We can see that gear C, the inner sprocket, drives gear D. And we can see that gear E drives gear F. If you're unsure which gear B and C is, we can see that gear C is smaller, so gear C has less teeth than gear B. And the same for D and E. E is smaller, therefore gear E has less teeth than gear D. So our driver gears are A, C and E. So next, which are our driven gears? Well, our driven gears are all of the ones that are being driven by the drivers. So A drives B, A is the driver, B is the driven. C drives D, C is the driver, D is the driven. E drives F, E is the driver, F is the driven. Now in the formula where it says product of driven over product of driver, what we're talking about is the product of the number of gear teeth. And the product is just the multiple. So for the product of the teeth on the driven gears, we have B being driven, we have D being driven, and we have F being driven. And our drivers, we have A is a driver, C is a driver, and E is a driver. Let's run some numbers and get our gear ratio. So driven, B, D and F, 55 times 70 times 85. Driver, A, C and E, 40, 15 and 20. Now when we run that through the calculator, we get a gear ratio of 27.3. So what we notice there is that we have a very high gear ratio in comparison to our simple gear train. Now that we have our gear ratio, we're going to calculate a couple of things. First of all, we're going to calculate the torque of gear F, and then we're going to calculate something called the holding torque. Now the method we're going to use to calculate the torque of gear F is we're going to calculate the ideal torque based on our gear ratio, and then we're going to apply our efficiency. So we calculated our gear ratio, 
and we found it to be 27.3 for the compound gearbox. Now we can use that gear ratio to calculate the ideal output torque and by ideal we mean the output torque if there were no losses. We said that the gear ratio was T out ideal over T in or T out ideal equals the gear ratio times T in. Our gear ratio is 27.3 and T in is specified in the question as 65, giving us an ideal output torque equal to 1,772.6 newton meters. So a very large ideal output torque. However, T out actual is T out ideal times our efficiency and our efficiency of 90% as a decimal is 0 0.9. So in actual fact our output torque is only 90% of the ideal value of 1772.6. So multiplying 1772.6 by 0 0.9 gives an actual torque of 15 95.3 newton meters. Okay, so the last thing that we need to calculate is something called the holding torque. And the calculation for this is relatively straightforward once you understand what the holding torque actually is. Now I'm going to use a small illustration to demonstrate this. What we have is we have a compound gear train, but that compound gear train can actually be enclosed inside a gearbox. So let's have a simple gearbox. Now that gearbox has an input shaft and it has an output shaft. If we refer to our diagram, we know that the input torque is in a clockwise direction. And we know the size of that torque is 65 newton meters. And we'll call that plus 65 since it's in the clockwise direction. However, our output torque is in the anti-clockwise direction and has a value of 1595.3. Now we'll call that negative since it's in the anti-clockwise direction. Now here's the important thing. In order for that gearbox to be in static equilibrium, we're going to need an additional torque in the clockwise direction. Because if we didn't have an additional torque in the clockwise direction, then the gearbox would spin in the anti-clockwise direction. It would spin because the torque in the anti-clockwise direction is significantly higher, so we need to apply a balancing torque. Now the magnitude of that balancing torque is just going to be the difference between our two torque values there. So the magnitude of TH is going to be 1595.3 minus 65. All I'm doing is finding the difference between those two values, which equals 1530 0.3 newton meters. Now from our illustration there, we know that that must be in the clockwise direction because it's balancing the net anti-clockwise torque caused by the rotation of the output shaft. So let's say in another question, we found that the input and output were in the same direction. Now we have 65 Newtons trying to turn it clockwise, plus an additional 1593.3 trying to turn it clockwise. Therefore, our balancing torque must be anti-clockwise, and it would have to equal the sum of 65 plus 1595.3. Because at the moment, we have a net torque in the clockwise direction, of 65 plus 1595.3. In this case, TH would equal 65 plus 1595.3, which equals 1660.3. However, this time the holding torque would be in the negative direction because it's balancing those two forces.
Now in practice, that holding torque would be applied by bolts clamping the gearbox to a surface. So we need to be able to calculate that holding torque to ensure those fixings are suitable and are gonna prevent the gearbox housing from rotating.